and refresh yours too probably and we'll go from there with some some other things so let's bring it up if I recall last time we had a project and a consultant object and I believe we completed the consultant class I should say and we had done at least a little bit on the um, project class so I think our job today is to finish up um, the project class so let's take a look and, and verify where we are and go from there All right, um, bring up the consultant class and bring up the project class. Now we had a couple of different test classes for these. If I recall right, test.java tested simply the consultant class by itself and the uh, test2 tested both of them and that's the one that we'll be looking at today. All right. Consultant, as you see, the um, someone asked, by the way, that um, I, I say public class, whereas in the text I think they just say class. Someone asked about that, and I gave an answer that was actually pretty close to being uh, dead on. A, a, a normal class like this would be no reason to make it private. What you might make private are what are called inner classes, and we'll talk more about those inner classes later on. All right, and those are typically for like event handlers. Uh, in other words, where you might have a class that's associated with a button on a GUI form. When you click the button, certain code goes off. Um, that, if you think about it, there's no reason that anything other than its parent class should be able to call it. So those are called inner classes. They're defined in the same file, and those you might make private. Um, notice we, also, we, we did make private the attributes. And it's the attributes themselves that we make private because we don't want folks going in and manipulating those directly. We want to very closely control how they manipulate them. Um, and we have to give the outside world some way to talk to this class. And therefore, we make the public set and get methods. So again, to be sure, these correspond to our attributes, but they're not the same as the attribute. They're the methods that are associated with the attributes. Is that what you're going to say? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Whereas the attributes themselves, the methods we make public because we want the outside world to be able to talk to those. We don't want the outside world to be able to set these indiscriminately. Uh, later on, we're going to add code to sets. Um, not gets quite so much, but, but sets where we might do some validation and make sure, for example, in this case, that um, the consultant type that we set has to be one of a certain number of, of legitimate values. We, the other methods that we had here is we had a get pay rate. And again, that's based on the type of consultant that they are. If they're a junior consultant, one pay rate, regular, senior. And then finally, we had their billing rate, which is simply three times their pay rate. Notice that we don't duplicate this code here. All right. Um, if it's defined that their uh, billing rate is three times their pay rate, then we call the method to get the pay rate. So the method to calculate the code for the pay rate only lives in one place. So if we were to change that somehow, We'd only need to make the change in the one method. We wouldn't have to have duplicate code. I think I've said before in this class, I know I've said it in others, sometimes blends between classes. But uh, one of your mantras as a programmer should be D-R-Y, do not repeat yourself. So code should live only in one place. All right. Our project, uh, let, let's, let's back up and look at the constructors. I, I've given two constructors to this. Again, you can tell that's a constructor because it's the same name as a class. You can have multiple constructors. And in fact, you can have multiple 
um, of any method, provided the methods have a different signature. And by signature, I mean a combination of the name and the arguments slash argument types. So in this case, for example, I can have two constructors for consultant because one of them accepts a string of arg name, so it accepts the, the consultant's name, and the other one accepts the name and the consultant type. I could not, for example, write a constructor that accepted only the consultant's type. All right, because I already have a method that accepts a single string argument. So I couldn't try to write another co uh, constructor that only accepted the argument, uh, an argument for the type of, cons uh, type of consultant uh, they were. I could, however, if there was some integer attribute, I could have a constructor that accepted a single integer, for example. So the, for, for uh, constructors, it's the number type combination has to be unique. All right. Uh, for other methods, the same thing. So I could have additional um, get pay rate methods, maybe that did slightly different calculations. Maybe one of them calculated and took into account overtime, and maybe one didn't, or, or something like that. All right. Our project should put private in front of that one. All right. Our project class has three attributes, has a uh, string for the customer name, has a double for hours, and has a um, consultant instance variable. These again, they're, they're called attributes. If you're talking about it from the perspective of the class, if you're talking about it from the perspective of an individual object, usually they call them instance variables because each instance of the object gets their own values for them. All right. This has one constructor that accepts the string for the customer name, a double which contains the number of hours, and it accepts a consultant object. And we set the uh, things appropriately. Remember. If we define any constructors, then we do not get the empty, uh, no argument constructor that typically the co uh, compiler inserts for us. So remember in the first few examples, uh, you know, the first few weeks of the class, we didn't define any constructors and everything worked out pretty good, right? The reason for that is if you don't define any constructors, the compiler slips one in for you. So the compiler adds one for you that simply creates an instance of the object and doesn't do any initialization. If, however, you define any constructors for your class, then you don't get that empty one for free. And if you want an empty one, you'd have to go and define it. All right, we only have the one method to calculate revenue that accepts um, or does it accept any arguments? It looks at the number of hours, grabs a consultant's billing rate, and multiplies them together to get the result. All right. We could have a calculate expense, assuming the only expenses were. Um, the, the consultant's wages, and that would oops, do that. And then finally, we could calculate uh, the, the gross margin, which would simply be the revenue uh, minus the expense. This, of course, refers to this object itself. So it's calling a method on itself to get the answer. I'll just say margin. I forget if that's called the net margin or gross margin. 
been a while since I had accounting classes. Notice that the code isn't repeated. In other words, if I want to calculate revenue, I don't have this instruction also down there, right? Because that would be repeating myself. I call the method that does that, all right? Nor do I have the formula in there like I have in the consultant class, which looks at the type of the consultant and determines, um, determines um, what... Uh, what, 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 their, what their pay rate is or what their billing rate is. That code exists as part of the consultant object because that's considered to be knowledge about consultants. How much a consultant is billed for is considered knowledge about the consultant. Therefore, it should be encapsulated or contained within the, um, within the um, um, class itself. If you're going to rate this on a scale of 1 to 5 on how clear all this is with the classes and the classes talking to each other, where 1 is you really don't understand it very well and 5 is you think you understand it pretty well, how would you rate it? How would you rate your understanding? How many would put it at a 1? How many would put it at a 2? How many would put it as a 3? How many would put it as a four? Okay. And how many would put it as a five? Okay, great. What I do want to show you, and maybe we won't take quite as much time as, as we would otherwise, but uh, I'm going, I, I want to um, show how oftentimes in software design, you sort of almost do a, a, a walkthrough where different people take the roles of different classes, all right? And you can only communicate through to the different objects through the, um, through the methods, all right? And I can ask an object to remember a value, that is I can ask it to set a, a, an attribute, and I can um, ask to call a method, in other words, do a get. Does anyone want to take the role of a consultant object? I know you, you're all dying to. All right, no one does. Okay, well I'll tell you what. I will, I, I, should, I should be wearing a hat today uh, and a jacket. I could, I could alternate between the three you know, when I'm wearing my hat, I'm the consultant. When I have my jacket on, yeah, I, I do have a jacket here. But so what I'll do is, is we'll do this on a sheet of paper, and and we will we'll, we'll sort of show you how the walkthrough is. But again, in an actual walkthrough, uh, you you have different people playing each role. Each role, and why do you do that? You do that again to sort of prove to yourself that you're encapsulating the stuff correctly, that your logic is correct. Really, it's a good way to sort of, uh, like a design exercise almost, before you start coding to see that you've designed your, your classes correctly. All right, so let's look at the main drag. And let's say I want to calculate margin in this case. So I will put calculate margin. All right, so let's run through this test scenario. Oops. So I run test two, and I call my main class, or I'm sorry, my main method. And the first thing it does is it creates a consultant object. So I have a consultant object, and I call the single argument constructor and pass it Mike. What that will do is that will go and it will set the name to the, for the argument and the type it will default to R. So my consultant class, uh, uh, object that's pointed to by C will have 
a name with the value of Mike and a type with the value of R. So that's what we have so far. We have a consultant object with the that's pointed to by C, which has a name um, of Mike and a type of R. And we could say something like, let's say for the sake of argument that, that this object lives on the heap in position 2000. All right. Next line of our is to create a project named P with the name for the customer of Acme Inc. Hours of 100 and I'm passing it that consultant object of C. So, what am I going to get then? I'm going to get a project it's pointed to by P in the main uh, uh, method. Maybe on the heap it's in position 3000. And the customer is Acme. The hours are 100. And the consultant is the consultant that is in position 2,000 on the heap. All right? Because remember, when we make this function call, all right, what that function call does, given that we've given an object reference, is it passes the pointer to that class. I'm sorry, a pointer to that object in the function. So therefore, what gets passed is the pointer to this object that we created and that we're storing in C. We pass that pointer so that's what gets stored in the project um, instance variable. My Lex line says system out print ln revenue p dot calculate margin. All right let's look at p's calculate margin. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call calculate revenue. Calculate revenue, we'll take the hours, which is 100, and we'll get the billing rate. Well, what's the billing rate? Well, we have to look and say, depending on the time of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was looking at pay rate. We take three times the pay rate, we'll call this, find that the pay rate is 30, so the billing rate is 90, this will return 90, and it'll take hours, which are 100 times 90, and give me a value in result of 9,000. All right. We then call the, the, the get expense calculation, which will go through the same thing. It'll take the hours times the pay rate, which we go through and determine it's 30, so that's 3,000. And it will do the subtraction, and it should come up and say, and return finally, because this will be 9,000, this will be 3,000, it should return a value of 6,000. All right? Um, to this, and therefore it should output it. Let's go and let's make sure that's indeed what happens. Let's go and save all these. And sure enough, it is, after I compile it and run it. This is known as desk checking. 
sometimes, another way to say it. And it can also be, uh, it can also be done as part of a design walkthrough. Um, but in my mind, this is sort of a, a lost art uh, because a lot of folks um, would just go and run it and see if it works, right? And, and uh, I'm not sure if I like that. It's good to really understand what's going on and, and to really walk through the steps and really be able to understand. It's good from two reasons. Number one, when you're first designing your class is to give a walkthrough to make sure that they work the way that you want them to, and then when you're eventually testing your code. I'm going to uh, I'm going to show a scenario and let's see if you can tell me what the answer will be. All right. I'm going to go in and I'm going to go into my test two. And let's call calculate expense instead. What do you think the result is going to be? Remember, expense is the pay rate times the number of hours. So we set our number of hours to 100. We initialize a consultant with the one argument constructor. We do a few other things and we calculate expense. Let's put up the consultant class, that relevant function to see what it is. What will the expense be? Looks like we have three possibilities. One would be 100 times 20 or 2,000. 100 times 30 or 3,000 or 100 times 40 or 4,000? How many think it would be 2,000 for the expense? How many think the expense would be 3,000? How many think the expense would be 4,000? Okay, let's find out. And then when we're done, let's make sure I've saved all this. When we're done, we can go through and make sure we all understand it. So let's go in here and compile it. Oh. It's a trick question. You see, you get an error. <laughs> well, you, you, you're, you're the rightest. Let's put it that way. That's, that's what I had intended to put. Does anyone want to change their answer now? That, that, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I had thought I had put. Comes out to be 40,000. How is that? Well, it deals with the fact, again, with the pointers. All right, let's go back to this scenario that we had up here. Whereas, when we call the constructor on the consultant, we get this, right, in this line of code. We create one with the name of whatever we pass it, and we default the type to R. So, after the constructor runs, 
the consultant object that's pointed to by C is in this state. Okay? We then create another object reference all right, variable and we don't set it to a new consultant. We simply declare that object reference variable. And in this line, we say D equals C. What does that mean again when we say D equals C? That means that there are now two variables that point to this object on the heap in our main routine. So this object, this consultant object, is pointed to by C, but it's also pointed to by D. All right? So at this point in the code, both C and D are pointing to the same object. All right? We then call our constructor, which creates a project P, and we give it these parameters, the customer name, the number of hours, and the object reference. Now remember, what happens when an object reference is passed as an argument? It's the pointer that gets passed. All right? So, when this is done, this consultant object that's part of the project points to this object in the heap, which is also pointed to by C in the main line and D in the main line. So all three references to a consultant in this particular example all point to that one object in the heap. All right. We then say D set type S. So what do we do? Well, where is the object that's pointed to by D? Well, it's this guy. We change that to S. So now the object that's pointed to by C, D, and the project's instance variable has a new type of S, and therefore when we do this calculation that says calculate the expense, P, uh, calculate expense, what it will do is it will say, hey, what is the pay rate associated with this consultant object? And what is the pay rate? How do we calculate that? Well, we look at its type, and that type has been changed. All right? So, again, the thing to remember here, the, the, the little trick of this one, is that when you're passing object references, you're passing the pointer. We don't, uh, another way to put that is in this code example, We only have one consultant object created because I only said new once. And all the other consultant object references in this example get pointed to that guy. So if I change any of them, it'll change all of them because they're all pointing to the same one. All right? Now, um, one thing I mentioned is that... Um, We probably would have a class for customer instead of simply a name. That way we could store other attributes for that. Maybe, for example, customers have discounts associated with them. You know, maybe for a, a big customer or a special customer we give, you know, 5% off. In which case we could go and change the project's um, methods to reflect that discount. All right. Um, one thing I posted, someone had asked me the, in, in lab on last Wednesday, how can I round this off, or how can I format this as currency? And let's take a second to look at that, because it's not necessarily obvious how you do it.
we can do it like this. We can create an object, all right, that's a number format ob object whose job it is to convert currencies. And then we can call the format function on that object to calculate uh, or, or round ours or, or format it uh, as a dollar amount. Let's go in and compile this. And we can see the difference. All right. And notice it shows it as currency with the dollar sign. It actually uses local settings on the machine to identify like what's meant to be the currency sign. So if I were in Europe or, or the UK or something, it would format it differently. Even to the point that if you notice, um, I forget exactly where, it might be South America. Actually, instead of a decimal point, they use a, a comma to separate uh, between um, essentially the dollars and cents. All right, so it's formatted differently. Now, that seems like a long way around, but again, th this provides for a lot of uh, internationalization options. Uh, for this. So it is funny uh, that, that, that something that you would think would be very simple and straightforward, when you have to address it in a, 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 a robust, fully functional, object-oriented way becomes fairly complicated. But again, you know, once, once you get it down, you know, you got it down. And okay, it's a couple of steps, a little harder to remember than maybe format currency of VB. But again, it does, does a lot more. All right. Now, one thing that you may notice when I did this, notice that this class name is a lot longer and it includes dots in it. All right? That's actually the package in, in which that class lives. All right? There's all sorts of packages that when you, when you downloaded the, the, the Java uh, development kit, you get a lot of packages. And you might not necessarily use those packages in, in every program, but they're available to you. But you have to tell the compiler where to find those packages. I may, for example, have written my own class called number format. And I don't want to use the pre-written one. I want to use mine. I might not even known there was such a thing. So there has to be a way to, to say, hey, where am I going to find this class? Otherwise, it would look through all the classes and it would take a long time to compile. So therefore, what you do is you can do one of two things. You can either do this, and that is give the full path to the class, all right, uh, the full package of the class, including all that, or you can import, all right. Now, if you go in here, if you went through uh, Java documentation, let's look up an array list, which we're going to be talking about in a minute here. When you look at Java documentation, you'll notice one of the first things they have there is a package in which it lives. All right. Java util. All right? And then this shows the inheritance structure. Um, some of these you get for free. Um, and you don't really have to, um, you don't really have to uh, d declare it that way. Let's go in here. Let's look for the Java system class, another class that we've been using. That's included in the Java Lang, and we don't have to specify that package. We can just say system dot, because it assumes that, that, that it'll find it in that one. All right. The other way that we can tell it the package that the class lives in is through the use of the import. And if I use the import, what I can do is this.
and then I don't have to specify the full uh, package path to that. When you say import, it's not like, say, a PHP include file, where it's going to bring something into your code. It's simply pointing to the compiler, hey, by the way, look for my classes somewhere in here. All right? So now we can go and do this, and it should still compile. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I cut too much code out. Right. Yeah, I cut too much code out. So you're right, I still have to declare that as an instance of that class, but I don't have to specify the full packages to it. And now we should be good to go. And again, we get the same result, but it's a little more concise, especially if you're going to be referring to this class in a bunch of places. Yes? Um, the dot refers to, again, what are called packages. Now, when we write our own custom classes, those will, each package will be in a separate folder, but this is relating to the system stuff and we don't really have our source code. Uh, we don't have the, the, jo the source code for the Java. So yeah, that, that this is, think of this more like as conceptual packages um, internal. But yeah, when we, write, when we write it, that will be, that will be, uh, there'll be folders that will correspond to that when we, when we start making packages from our classes. Yes. Okay, that's a, that's a great question. The question is, is I don't have a new in here, and yet this seems to work. Let's look it up. All right. Here's our number format class that's in Java text. And notice the method that we called is get currency instance. Let's take a look at that method in the documentation. First thing that we see and this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it is a great question, so we might as well address it now. But the first thing that we see is that that is a static method. All right. What does a static method mean? A static method means that an instance of that class is not required to call that particular method. For example, where we've seen this before is in our system.out.println. We never said create something as new system, right? We're calling a method on the class and not on the object. Um, so the, the method exists on the class level and not the object level. When, what I mean by the object level is you do not require an instance of that to call it. You can call it on the class itself. So think of static as being like class level functions. Functions that you don't need an object for, you can simply call them on the class. So. I can say number format dot get currency instance and what, so I can call that without creating an instance and what it's going to do for me is it's going to return a number format object. All right. Think of get currency instance on this class as a little factory to create number format objects. So. Given that there's a lot of stuff that's done with this when you get currency, remember I said it like looks localization features and all that, I wouldn't simply say equals new. I instead ask this method, and that method has the brains to create that object correctly. So this method is really a little object factory. 
all right, that's going to, that when I ask for it, it's going to give me a properly prepared number format object ready to convert currencies. All right? And it's a static object. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a static method. Therefore, an object isn't required. So I can call that sort of factory to create that um, without having an instance of it. So this is the way we get an instance of this kind of object. Presumably because there's a lot of initialization that's going to go on. And there might be a lot of initialization that really is machine dependent, right? Because your locale information is, is recorded differently on a Windows machine than it would be on a Unix machine or on, a, uh, on uh, a Linux machine or whatever. That's me sort of speculating, all right? But the idea here is this is a different way to create an object. And, it, 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 and, and the... The, the short answer of why I don't have to have an instance is because that's a static method, and static methods don't have that. The longer answer is this static method, what it does is it returns an object. So there's a new somewhere inside that static method. We don't have the source code to see exactly how it does it, but there's a new embedded in that static method that makes a number format object defined a certain way, and that gets returned to the NF. All right. I know that sounds a little, little like like voodoo maybe, but uh, again, it's uh, think of it as like a little little object factory. We can call this function. We can get an object that's properly prepared. Um, we could actually, you know, write our own method like this if we wanted to. Um, let's let's spend a second. Nah, nah, let's not bother. When we talk more about static methods, maybe, maybe bring this up and maybe we can write a method that, that does almost the same thing. We can see how it's done. Now, if you're bringing in a bunch of classes from a package, you can do like dot star. And bring in, whoops, and bring in all of the packages in there. And again, I'm saying bring in. Um, I don't literally mean bring in. I mean point to. All right. Remember, this is, it isn't like this brings in that code or brings in something to your uh, program. It simply tells the compiler, look for the classes that I'm referring to here. Yes. Um, yeah, that might be a good way to say it. Um, it, it's it's sort of like the path to variable, just for a different purpose. Um, it's defining where to find the classes to, to hopefully remove any any amb ambiguity or, or or whatever for that. All right. What will we talk about next time? We will talk about next time array list. What's a limitation of arrays? A limitation of arrays is they, they are of a certain static size. and They don't get any bigger. All right? So you'd have to declare an array as having three spots in it. And if you wanted a fourth element in that array, or you, array you're out of luck. You can't easily solve that. An array list is a much more flexible um, structure. And again, we can go and we can look for the Java, the Java docs on this. I would, by the way, become familiar with how to read these Java docs because they're very valuable. They're valuable once you learn how to read them. All right. Uh, initially, you look at this and it's kind of like, huh? You know, what does that mean? But really what it tells you is it tells you, again, the class what package it's found in, what it inherits from, what fields are in there, what the constructors are, and what methods that you can access. And then details about the constructor and all that. 
Now, what's good about the array list is the array list is dynamic. In other words, we can add and remove things from it, which makes it good for our purpose of the consultant because what we could do is actually, um, we could actually um, add a consultant to a project if we wanted to, all right, and, and, and so on. And um, that's what we'll do next time. We'll, we'll do some example, whether it be with this or, or something else that will relate to array lists. Questions about this? All right. Um, yes, go ahead. Yes, a, a, uh, yeah. Essentially, that would be an array of arrays. Um, let's let's look at. All right. Here's some examples of, of allocating an array. Let's try to make the text bigger. Yeah. Here's how we could, we could uh, create a, a two-dimensional uh, array of integers where there were effectively ten rows and five columns. They refer to them as rows and columns, but really they're, they're more like abstract dimensions. Uh, I guess it's useful to think of it, this is like a grid with rows and columns in it. The idea is, is essentially what this is saying is that we have ten arrays of integers, each consisting of five elements. So we have a five element array and we got ten of them. All right, that's what the ten by five means. And again, a good way, usually the way that that's represented is, is as a grid that would have um, ten rows and five columns of it. So in essence, another way to say this is this is an array of arrays. So you first say which array you want, all right, then from that array you say what element of that array do you want as opposed to just saying what element of the array you want. So you would supply two subscripts and it's pretty consistent with how you would do it in other languages as well. And again, this is, this is a good thing. How many, how many objects are here? All right. This says six objects, a one-dimensional array of five elements for each of the arrays of ten elements. So. Oh, that adds up to be six, I'm not sure, but I'll take their word for it. All right. Any, any other questions? Well, we'll see you over in lab then.